So we'll um, we'll go ahead and get started. I hear people continuing to dial in on the line. And I will note that today's um, information session will be recorded. So if you have any concerns at all with that in terms of the questions, feel free to take comment cards or you can email us separately if that's a concern for you. But we wanted to make sure that the results of this information session are available to everyone. My name is Joanna Trotter. I'm with the Chicago Community Trust. Um, I'm a program office here. My, my focus is community economic development and housing. And I just wanted to welcome you all. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your interest. I know we actually have folks in the room that help to craft and advocate for this legislation. So we're just excited to be a partner um, in moving this forward with a, a, a small role that we're taking on. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the trust, we're a over community foundation. We serve the greater Chicago region. Um, so we're essentially partners with donors that do grant making on a regular basis. So this is a good role for us to play. But we also recognize that this is a statewide initiative and we want to make sure that we are supporting statewide efforts and, and making sure that we have a geographic reach in this effort. So as you uh, know of partners working in other parts of the state, please make sure to promote this. We're trying to get to get this out as much as possible. Um, and we want to make sure to do a round of introductions. So also uh, introduce Peter Klaus, uh, with Foresight Design, as well as Adrian Escoval with uh, the Chicago Land Workforce Funders Alliance. So they'll be joining me in the presentation. They'll talk a little bit about their organization for the home. And let's do a quick round of introductions because we want to know who's in the room. Absolutely, thank you. Good morning. afternoon, everybody, right? It's Monday. LaShonda Hayes, YWCA. Uh, hopefully so. Pastor Vance, uh, face and place. Janine Adi, Elevate Energy. Uh, Dr. Antonio Lopez with the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Thanks for coming. Sarah Jones, the foundation. I'll just ask the folks who are on the line to please put your phones on mute. We're hearing a lot of background noise. Thank you. My name is Barrera, and I'm with EDF. Hi, I'm Peter Nicholson. I work with Peter Toth at Foresight. I'm with the or the Chicago um, Center for Arts and Technology. I'm Carol Pollitt from IBEW Local 134. Terry Yodi from IBEW Local 134. Just name and organization. Cleo Fisley, OAI. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still hearing a lot of background noise on the phone, so can everybody just put their phones on mute? Thank you very much. Hi, this is Amy uh, Organization. Oh, I'm Leslie McKenna with the Illinois Solar Energy Association. Hi, Leslie. Good to meet you all. Great. Um, so, I just wanted to say just briefly, the, the trust role here is to simply make recommendations to comment. So we aren't housing the funds or distributing the funds. We're simply reviewing and, so, or, and collecting applications and then making recommendations to comment uh, for final distribution in support of this um, or, or of the RP. So we've been facilitating that. Uh, Foresight has been on contract with us to support this effort. Um, so I wanted to, again, have Adrian talk a little bit about PSWFA and then uh, Peter to talk about foresight and then the actual program itself. Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Estabel. I'm the Deputy Director for the Chicago and Post Sports Funder Alliance. We are a uh, funder collaborative uh, housed here at the Chicago Community Trust of 14 different workforce development foundations um, who do their own individual workforce development grant making and we do pool funding. So it's the Trust, Joyce Foundation, Fry Foundation, et cetera to do their own individual grant making and then they also make a grant to the pool, to so the Funder Alliance. And we do grant making with the mission to improve employment, earnings, and racial equity for underserved workers in the Chicago land area. And we do that through three different investment strategies through employer engagement, systems change, and job quality. Um, our, so our role with this process has been, like Joanna said, the trust is serving as um, a facilitator for the for the RFP process, and we've been lending some some help on the workforce development technical side of it. All. So that's just kind of how we fit into today's presentation. So I'm uh, Peter Toth with Foresight Design Initiative. But we are an innovation studio based in Chicago. I've been around since 2003. Well, we've done a variety of sustainability related projects, both uh, together with individual organizations and also. Um, Help to facilitate partnerships of organizations that are uh, trying to advance the sustainability efforts in the region. 
And I'll just quickly say, so this is our agenda today. Um, we will go and provide some background on the legislation. We'll talk to the RFP, the kind of criteria we're looking for, um, give you some advice and see how to put together a good proposal. Um, but we also leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, as well as the opportunity for you all to call each other if you don't already. So um, that's the intention to make sure this, this RFP is really going to be, the applicants will be competitive based on partnerships. But we don't expect one organization to try to meet all the criteria to create a really healthy pipeline. So we're hoping that, again, you take this time to get to know with colleagues here in the room and well as well think about other partners that may not be here at the table today. Right. Um, for, for the uninitiated, I just wanted to provide a quick um, quick background on the Future Energy Jobs Act, which is uh, the reason we're all here today. Um, this um, uh, act was passed in December of 2016 and took effect uh, June And um, although it was kind of got the most news attention for uh, providing funding to help Exelon keep its uh, nuclear fleet open, it also uh, represented a a big towards um, a cleaner energy economy in the state. Um, does a, num does a number of ways yeah. by expanding energy efficiency, uh, strengthening the state's uh, renewable portfolio standard, uh, which will help to accelerate the deployment of wind and solar energy across the state. Uh, it commits resources specifically to help low income communities take advantage of these new opportunities. And then it also dedicates funding uh, for uh, workforce development to make sure that they, uh, that Illinois workers are prepared to um, participate in the deployment of, of energy efficiency and of, uh, with their solar projects. So I just wanted to dive in and provide um, um, some details on, on how this act will accelerate uh, the solar energy sector in Illinois. Uh, so um, based on uh, projections from uh, the Solar Energy Industries Association, uh, in the next four years, uh, this act uh, could result in, uh, in over 1,000 additional megawatts of, uh, of solar energy in the state. Um, and just as a point of reference, the current capacity across the state is, is less than uh, 100 megawatts. So talking about a tenfold increase in four years. Uh, in terms of the specific uh, job creation numbers, uh, due to this legislation, there's kind of varying estimates out there. It depends on the modeling that's used. Um, this uh, this range, which is pretty large, admittedly, um, is from the um, uh, the Solar Foundation, which does a uh, solar job regularly. And uh, the the bottom range of this range, 1,600 jobs created is really based on current national trends. So it doesn't even take into effect, it take into account the effects of the future energy jobs act. Um, the highest range of job creation, 1,600 new jobs, um, is kind of maximizing Illinois' solar installation. Um, so the odds are that, that the total uh, job creation in the next four years will fall somewhere in that range. Um, uh, so far, I haven't seen like one consistent uh, set of figures for that. Um, but it'll, needless to say, it will be um, significant, likely. Um, the current, current uh, solar workforce in the state is, is uh, just under 4,000. So um, even an increase, even the lower end of that increase will be pretty significant the four year span. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the context in which uh, the solar training pipeline is, uh, is happening. Um, so, as I mentioned, as uh, part of this uh, of the Future Energy Jobs Act, uh, ComEd is required to spend uh, $10 million, uh, in 2017, 2021, and 2025 on uh, three different workforce development initiatives to ensure that uh, Illinois' workforce is prepared for, um, for the various energy-related projects that will happen as a result of the Future Energy Jobs Act. So, um, First is a, uh, a craft apprenticeship program um, for $3 million. And this is not necessarily uh, related to solar installation jobs, although um, that's, that's one area in which you could focus. Uh, the second is multicultural training, which is divided into um, among six different organizations that provide services to specific communities across the state. And then finally, uh, the, the RFP discussed for a solar training pipeline program. Um, and it's just wanted to note that this is the only um, 
only program <laughs> of these three that is will be selected through the committee. If the others, uh, the other two in the statute are described specific organizations that will uh, receive the funding. And just another thing to, to reiterate um, is that these are kind of, these, the 10 million happens every four years uh, until 2025. Um, so so the, uh, the solar training pipeline will, will, uh, will get 3 million in this year, uh, 3 million in 2021, and 3 million in 2025. So it will be dispersed across uh, 12 years. So I'm going to um, turn over to Adrian to kind of summarize what we mean by a solar training pipeline. So hi again. Um, so Before yeah. Adrian starts, I'll just say one more time. If those who are on the phone can please go on mute. We're just hearing typing and voices in the background. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, so hi again, Adrian. Um, so what's on the slide right now is just kind of some of the components that are going into the RFP. Um, there's greater detail uh, in the actual document. I'll just kind of go over some, an overview of, of some of the, the stuff listed on there. And if we want to go into more granularity, um, feel free, we can just stop or ask questions. But I'll just kind of give a brief overview of what it is. So it's recruitment, training, and placement. So we're looking for responses that are able to, um, to do all three in a way that moves forward. Now, important to note also that um, within the recruitment section, um, specifically called out, um, looking at people who have a record or who've been involved with the criminal justice system at some point, um, people who've been involved in the foster care system, and also looking at the highlight areas that are designated as environmental justice communities. Um, so those kind of speak for themselves. Um, and we're looking for organizations that both have a track record of working with those individuals or who can also establish a partnership with organizations that have, a, that have worked with those as well. Uh, called out in the RFP is that um, it's understood that a lot of expertise that looks that we're looking for in all three components might not be in one organization. So um, groups working together is uh, uh, something that's encouraged. So. Um, as far as foster care alumni, again, these people who are involved in the foster care system. And then there's also this uh, focus on environmental justice communities. Um, the RFP has a definition of it so that it's using, but um, we're looking at minority, low income, tribal or indigenous populations, or geographic locations in the United States, potentially experience a disproportionate environmental harm and risk. So that's an overview. There's a little bit more of the definition in the actual RFP. But as far as the recruitment goes, those are the priority groups that are that are involved. Um, and we'd be looking for um, experience working with those populations or and, and a strategy that will um, define how they're going to rec how you're going to recruit to those as well. So we're looking at specific mechanisms for for re reaching prospective trainees. Um, looking at potential barriers to be bringing people in to become trainees as well. A lot of times. Uh, we won't want to be cognizant and respectful of the fact that somebody who might have various employment might be ready for the entry level training position already. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the wraparound support of the next section in training. Um, as far as training goes, um, kind of a standard kind of training RFP, uh, describing enrollment, onboarding, training, um, the model that's going to be used, classroom, virtual uh, partnerships, and, and curriculum that might be available. Um, but I really want to call out the wraparound support element as well, especially when working with individuals that have barriers to employment or have been in underserved areas. Um, we're looking for support services that um, will be provided for trainees or, or established for trainees. This could include um, just general case management, financial empowerment, childhood assistance, child care assistance, workers' rights education. Just that's something that is called out specifically. And I would just, again, say that an organization that might not be able to find that in themselves would identify partners they would have that would be able to help them uh, as well. Technical and certifications. Um, the RFP called out, there are specific um, there are like solar pathways that have been um, established on the mission for qualified and credentials that are available are pathways, credentials for solar pathways. And a part of the 
technical skills and apprenticeship, it would be linking to those as well or a plan to link to those. I know some people do that for Provided, link up at this point. Placement, that gets into connections also with employers as well. Um, a lot of the work um, of, the, of the funder alliance and workforce development now is everything to be demand driven or, or and that's no that's definitely apparent here as well. Um, so we're looking for connections with employers, but not just for the connection for employers to employers' sake, but also thinking what are ways that you screen screen employers that to have some safeguards that they actually have decent wages or, or good conditions at, at their at their plants as well or their individuals as well. So. Um, that's a really quick overview of both recruitment training and placement. I don't know if we want to pause now for just specific questions or what we're doing that. But, um. yeah, I think it kind of just like clarifying questions just about the, the program and the pipeline the spell if I don't want to take the time. I'll just remind folks once again, if uh, those who are on the phone, can you please go on mute? We're just hearing voices in the background. I think we've got some new people join us on the line. Any questions? Is there a certain hourly wage you would like participants to earn as a result of completing this training? There isn't a specific wage um, specified in the RFP, but if that's if that's a um, if that's one of the criteria that the proposed program is going to set, then we'd we'd welcome that as as a, as one of those criteria. I would just add too that we would also look at um, you know pathways to get in there. So there are also build, or there are also ways to, to build in kind of apprenticeship programs or other or other programs that like subsidize wages as well. So all those kind of creative elements of, of financing and packaging with the relationships with the employers would, would be not required, but kind of get to that. So there's not like one target, but I think the overall goal is to have a pathway towards those political skills. And wage plan, little wage plan. Any other clarifying questions? Well, we are still in the legislation. We carved out the legislation. People with a record was not the language that we used. We used returning citizens, and it's primarily because we're very careful about making sure the language is open enough so that we don't scare folk. Um, and we, we were real clear about what that meant and, and how. So we probably need to again look at that to see how we make sure when we begin to lay this out or, or present this, how that can be helpful. Uh, and as you already identified in the, legis in the RPF and as the legislation, the environmental justice uh, communities was still a, a work in progress. Uh, how clearly to define it. You did, you did a pretty good job of trying to clear, clarify that, but we just really need to help communities understand and people understand this legislation, what that means and, and what particular areas we need to expand our work to uh, and, and uh, how they have been identified. Um, the certifications and the apprenticeships, uh, which is very critical with IBEW, uh, and we've talked through some things in relationship to that, but. One of the things about the career path discussion that we've had is that we not want to talk about installer jobs, but we want to talk about training to help people beyond the installation. And we're looking at some of the trainings, as you know, some of the certifications are not going to take the initial six to eight weeks. They're going to take longer, but we want to make sure that we present a myriad of options for people so that they understand that if they want a career path, they're going to have to stay in this process for the long haul. And we, we need to provide, whether it's the community colleges or these other avenues, to direct people past the initial training to some of these other opportunities so that they can benefit towards this career path piece. And, um, so, so, yeah, but uh, the other ones are looking good. With regard to his question, uh, in terms of us, uh, uh, placement, so career path also be recognized as a career placement. If you have identified as a person moving on to once you finish the training, moving on into a career path for that uh, for person asking in that area. Does that make sense? Could you repeat the question? Yes, I'm sorry. Well, what, I'm trying, what I'm getting to is that uh, once a person has completed their training and they continue to want, want to stay in that field, 
and if they pursue that field for further advancement, would that be considered a placement? Yeah, I would, I would assume, yeah, if they're in, involved in a job that's related to the training that they received, mm -hmm. and it's related to, I mean, that's, I'll have to you know, look at the specifics on how the RFP is written, but I know that for a lot of public agencies, for example, credit is given for, for training that leads to employment that's relevant to the skills that were obtained, so I would, my instinct would be yes, that would make sense. Yeah. Kind of like continued education. He's just, what he's asking is, are they going to be jobs? The job's going to be real. And he wants to make sure that it's connected. And he doesn't want the language to be vague enough where people have been trained. And like you just said, people will get credit when the jobs actually appear and when people are actually working. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. okay. We have language in the RFP for applicants to address those kind of partnerships that ensure that. So I think. There's a broader question about the legislation overall and how it's enforced, et cetera. Um, but in terms of the RFP, that's what we're looking for is that thoughtfulness around ongoing career pathways, not just immediate placement. Yeah. So we're looking for partnerships in place that help to address that. Yep. My name is Zimmer Ryan Tom. Sorry, I got here so late. Thank you. So, okay, that gets to the whole layering partnerships with with credentials as well, that, it's a, that, that that's a priority in thinking through the training process that it gets people trained in skills that could be applicable, yes, into this pipeline, but we want people to, to kind of the point that was being made. People with pathways to justice. We're back again, that folks on the line go on mute. We're hearing dogs barking and, and conversations in the background. So that would be helpful, thank you. I just want to clarify, so this is an RFP to train for solar installer position, correct? And what's the relationship with that and the on page number five, qualified persons. Is that, is that chart? Is that a description of how people can advance in in the field? So, uh, they, uh, the RFP is exclusively um, focused on on um, on solar installation jobs. It could be other solar career pathways, um, but we expect that the installation jobs will be the bulk of new jobs created. Um, so, and there are specific um, criteria that people need to meet to be qualified solar installers in the state of Illinois. So that's why we've included this chart. Um, in terms of other career pathways in, in manufacturing or um, uh, sales, uh, things like that, um, those, those types of jobs are also uh, welcome uh, in terms of for proposals. But we've included the qualification for installer jobs just because that's that's what's highlighted in the statute, but it's not exclusive. So, so one of these um, five and six would be an outcome program that someone is prepared to take an step exam or one of the other things. Okay. And then my other question is, are there um, any established curricula for um, this industry available? I know. Purchased, um, potential partners may have one, or we have to find that out. Uh, I, I, I don't think so, I don't know. Okay. There are some companies that are, are going to apply for training that have all the curriculum, so they will help folks go. And that's our goal is to connect those kind of access training so that folks can pass the test. And uh, the other piece that's a very important part is the issue of board screening, and uh, that's going to be so folks need to be prepared that they need to clean up now, not clean up later, because clean up now makes make sure that they're able to pass the test. We haven't determined, and that's part of our discussion, about whether they be tested to do before, during, or after. But we just need to be aware of that if, as we go into the community to talk to folks. We need to talk about clearly that. Um, not only the certification is very important, but the people stand relatively clean. We'll take one more uh, clarifying question, and then we'll talk through the RFP itself, and then come back to questions at the end. I think I just wanted to round up on the qualified person question. So in Illinois, you do need to have somebody on your crew who qualifies under the distributed generation certification for the state of Illinois. But not everybody on your crew has to be a qualified person person, you just need somebody that can oversee that's a qualified person. But the paths, I think, and I don't have that printed out in front of me, sorry, um, but the paths that have been laid out are those 
Yeah, are the ways to get that qualified person on your on your crew. Does that make sense? I just wanted to give that little nuance. But we do have, there are identified trainings and as uh, has been kind of laid out, it maps up in the certification pathway that the industry values quite a bit. <laughs> It's great not having experts in the room. <laughs> it can help. Like a little nuance, right? Like, not everyone needs to be QP. Okay, so a couple things for you all to keep in mind in terms of timing. Um, we are collecting your questions today. We'll have a response to those questions that we'll post both on the trust website um, and the control system, which we'll talk a little bit more about at the end. And we'll just send it around as well to the folks who've registered for today's information session. So uh, it'll be available in those three, three ways. Um, so we'll, uh, those will be due this Thursday in terms of your questions. So if anything comes up as you leave this room, please email us and we'll have that available. Um, and then again, the response will <coughs> posted next week on the um, Peter will talk a bit about office hours, but there will be opportunities to ask further questions post this information session. Proposal are due on August 31st uh, by before midnight, 11.59. Uh, you can post questions both through our Grant Central system if you're having any questions or trouble through the system itself, but in terms of overall, just of legislation and the RFP itself, Peter is your resource. Um, and then we'll do interview site visits uh, for selected applicants in terms of those who uh, we may have follow-up questions for you. It may not mean that you're sort of uh, ranked at the top, but we just need to understand the proposal more, so don't take the fact if you don't get a site visit doesn't mean that you're not um, uh, prioritized in terms of the response. We just uh, sometimes it's, it's both timing and just needing to make sure we prioritize those that we just need more information from. So just know that. Um, then we'll submit recommendations to comment. Again, con uh, the trust is a housing fund, they're distributing the funds for these recommendations to comment. And then the selection notifications will, will come at the end of the year. I have a question. Yes. On the Grand Central, uh, to register for that, I attempted to do that it does not um, recognize my organization. The, the information is not uh, complete. Oh, I contact the RIS, it's right there. Why oh, it's not linking to the Grand Central database, I have no idea. Well, let's follow up after the meeting and we can troubleshoot with you. We're happy right. to do that. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> So in terms of eligible applicants, um, one thing I'll say, I was going to mention this a little later, but you know, the trust funds strictly nonprofits and government entities, so our grant central system is set up with questions that relate to those sectors. Um, that doesn't mean that you uh, to those sectors. So uh, we're using our grant central as a platform to receive applications, but if you have any trouble with your private entity applying through that system, let us know some of the things courts might be that we're asking for I-90, which is a nonprofit um, audit. You could just upload your regular audit as a private uh, organization. But if there's any trouble or questions you may have as you fill that out, just given that, let us know and you can uh, ask grant central computer. Um, so for those with specific expertise in workforce development, educational institutions, solar industry, employers, and community-based organizations, and then of course partnerships across them are wonderful uh, given the pipeline goal. Um, this is an important note is that if you are um, Peter explains you cannot be a lead applicant for this. So you could be a partner, but not a lead applicant. So just keep that in mind um, based on the other two components of the financial legislation. Um, program components. So um, key proposal elements, demonstrate the ability to contribute to a statewide pipeline. Uh, so we're looking at geographic distribution. That's going to be really to consider um, and prioritize organizations that sort of span that or that we're making sure that we are funding um, and distributively across the state. Uh, recruitment from priority groups, so we talked a little bit about that. So again, looking at your organization's capacity, if you don't serve those groups now, who are you partnering with that know how to serve those groups, what kind of rapid services are you bringing for in terms of addressing that and making sure that those groups and their particular needs are supported. And solar installer qualifications, so this includes things like employer partnerships, 
um, and in coordination with the Illinois Solar for All and other workforce development programs. And then we're also looking for, you know, both um, we need employer partnerships, but also the ability to educate employers because they're going to need to understand this legislation. So you're sort of as applicants and, and being funded under this program, ambassadors to the program so that they understand it. Um, just a few notes in terms of uh, proposal writing and what we'd be looking for. Number one, just keep in mind, and we'll talk a little bit about the review committees, but not everybody on the review committee are workforce uh, experts. And so, uh, industry jargon, uh, acronyms, et cetera. I'll speak to an uh, audience that may not know your field, right, as clearly because the, the groups that we're pulling together both have expertise in workforce, but also community development issues, also how you serve these target populations, et cetera. And so that's the audience that you're speaking to as you write. Um, keep in mind the pipeline goals front and center as you assess the organization's own capacity and gaps. We fully expect that organizations themselves don't have everything needed in order to make this a successful application or a successful, successful partnership. So first look at yourselves and then think about the partners that help to fill that gap and, and that will be um, the kind of partnerships that we would, um, would consider um, so as you look at that, think about your ability to reach and engage the populations we're discussing, your ability to provide the kind of support services and needed to support them. We'll be looking at um, how do you sort of resolve the barriers to entry for many of those groups and populations. Your geographic reach, please be really clear on, on the counties you're serving, but also the specific geographies within those counties so that we really understand the um, And then your relationships with employers in the energy industry. So those are the kind of things as you're starting to assess your own capacity where you might need to fill gaps if you don't have it, that skill set or that those, those set of partnerships. Um, uh, there's a couple ways that you could uh, demonstrate your partnership. So one is through the narrative itself, so explain partners' roles, uh, who they are, their expertise and background, and what role they're playing in this partnership, but also through letters of, of support, through memorandums of understanding, and through the budget itself. So those are three ways that you can really demonstrate the strength of the partnership that you have in place. Um, and then we talked a little bit about eligible applicants, um, the elements, and then um, in terms of the, uh, the actual funding, the funding amount, so again, these numbers are over the four years, so uh, over four years is 150000 yeah. Um, and then in terms of what you know, the little bit of knowing that ComEd is going to require regular reporting of those outcomes. Um, so, given that there's a lot of uh, moving parts and complexity um, in this RFP uh, and, and the statute itself, uh, I, we're going to kind of have office hours available for, um, for applicants to follow up with questions. Uh, related to their specific proposal. So, um, if you if you're looking for um, some direction on on um, how you're structuring your program or other wording, there will be time slots available for you to talk to me about those. Um, I do request that uh, you email me um, a time slot, um, and I'll be available um, on uh, seven days total uh, from from nine to noon. Uh, to talk through those things. Um, all the information for uh, reaching me and these dates, again, are all in the RFP. Uh, and the, that seems to be uh, the more, uh, these, these uh, sorry, these office hours are focused more on uh, applicants involved their specific proposals, so if there's things you might not want to uh, make public everyone through the questions that are to be on the website, um, you can call into this number and sort of ask. And uh, Foresight isn't involved in uh, in reviewing or scoring the proposal. We'll, we'll be um, administering the review process, but we won't be making any decisions. So um, yeah, that's pretty uh, The other thing I'll just say quickly is that as you look at your outcomes, um, we would love you to think about the smart principles, right? Um, so really thinking about how you're, um, how you can evaluate, and I think it's another way for you to um, 
build off of your own experience as industry experts. Um, so looking at specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound, right, all of those. But also, if you tell us that you think 90% will be um, placed, how, do you, how are you getting at that number? Do you have experience in, in having that kind of success rate, for example? So it's just another good way to demonstrate your track record and your understanding of how do you, how do you create really strong workforce pipelines. Um, and we'll look to that experience as we evaluate it. All right. Yeah, and then again, um, uh, we'll be accepting questions uh, via email until this Thursday. Um, and these, the, all the questions and their responses will be posted online for everyone to see. So uh, I, I'm guessing if, if one person ever has a question on something, then a lot of people will really have a similar question. So um, this is a way to kind of consolidate that and make sure everyone has the answers they need. But uh, if you have any questions beyond that, that's uh, what the office hours are for. Quick question. Is there a, uh, a link to the responses, page count? What, what are we looking at there? Yeah, you're, uh, you'll see that when you go into Grant Central, there are word count limits as you're filling it out. So, but you'll get sections where you Alright, so Adrian, do you want to talk a little bit? So we have two committees. Um, on the technical review committee. We have one on the technical review committee. Um, I will not speak to the technical review committee. Um, I will not speak to the technical review committee. Anyway, but um, so we're going to be looking at the job creation, the workforce development um, component a lot. Everybody listed here kind of has experience working through um, evaluating proposals, just kind of standard workforce the training and the placement. Um, also, I would just kind of, I would just really note that um, Matt, as the director of the Funder Alliance, Jennifer and I, and they're also members of the Funder Alliance, and uh, Funder Alliance, which added racial equity to the component of their, of their work, but they definitely have that, that lens to it. And I think we look at the targeted communities that are <laughs> part of this RFP as well, but that would be something to be highlighted. So I kind of flag that note for people who are here, but that, that's kind of top of mind for a lot of individuals. Well, not the other ones, don't, don't think about it either, but just wanted to just flag that as a, as a comment. Um, so it'll just be kind of, yeah, I don't know if I have any questions on the technical aspects of it all, but it'll just be evaluated similarly to how we described the RFP earlier. Some of the stuff that I highlighted and prioritized during that section, during that slide, will be, will be things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the policy review, this is just, uh, again, recognizing the complexity of the and how this lands locally. So uh, these folks will be um, screening beyond workforce um, expertise and the pipeline, but really issues around the populations you're trying to serve, what kind of support services you're putting in place, considerations around the industry itself, and the like expertise in the solar uh, industry, so what kind of things you need to be looking for in that, whether it's a way to, to create a review that's more well-rounded, but all of these folks are volunteering their time to really provide an objective review to the, to the applicants that we're having later this year. So um, program criteria, so we've spoken to a lot of this, but clarity of program description, um, including goals, activities, work plans, timetables, budget, metrics, again, and talk to the support criteria and how you're going to evaluate success over time. Um, ComEd has not yet established its reporting, but it'll really be informed by I think what you're coming up with in terms of how you can evaluate and how frequently that will happen. So just know that they're developing that, but that will be an expectation of them reporting over the four years. Um, alignment of the program's activities to achieve the solar training type of program objectives, including but not limited to something about across the way. Uh, we're looking for holistic approaches in supporting, preparing, and placing trainees, again, particularly the, the priority uh, groups that we talked about today, uh, particularly uh, those who are, what are we using, not just involved, returning citizens, thank you, and those involved with, or formally involved in the foster care system. Uh, realistic projections, I see that just the timetable, and then, of course, my people success. That margin is built on track records of the partners involved. In terms of organizational criteria, 
and you can read yourself, but um, some of the things I'll highlight is, again, is capacity and track record. We're looking for strong partnerships to really uh, round this out. We're looking for the ability to work with priority groups, understanding of the solar industry, and then it's for women and minority-led organizations. And then finally, I know there's some questions starting to come up with Grand Central, so we'll troubleshoot as needed as this come up. But the first step is to create an organizational profile if you're not already in our Grand Central system. And again, that organizational profile is largely catered to nonprofit and government organizations. So if you, if you have any trouble with that, if you're a private organization applying, uh, let us know. But I think the main difference is going to be the, the audit requirement that you still upload your your private uh, organization to audit, it's not a 990, but there's a way to do that. Um, so again, uh, we, we, we will uh, take applications from private sector, um, and then it has all of your contact information, which is critical to have. Finally, you're going to collect the funding opportunity, which again is listed as solar pipeline training program. So this is what that screen looks like after you've done your org profile. And then the third step is the application itself. So you'll see these tabs. The two tabs you'll be filling out are the project description, the detailed questions, and the project budget. And those, there's fields for those questions. So again, limitations. You'll see that as you go through the process. That's it. So, um, so now it's time for the open Q&A, and I know we started already ask questions. It would be great, though, just for everybody in the room, if as you ask questions, you introduce yourself to the organization again, because I know we have a new folks coming in. Great. Any questions? That's a fantastic, Lance. Face to place. Is this going to be done downstate? Uh, in the info session? Yeah. Um, we're just providing this one info session. We, we offered a call-in option for, um, for those who uh, couldn't be in Chicago. We'll also post uh, this recorded webinar on the website, so uh, if anyone gets it, who wasn't able to make it. So I may, may need some help with that, because that's the brief we got all through the process was how do we make sure that downstate and folk uh, have access to the process? And if there's ways we can work together to make sure that, you, that we can make, that they know what's going on, it would be great to see because I know, you know, us here we're trying to get to the table with whoever, but we need, might need some help with that. What's the grant period? And um, are you looking for each grantee to have a certain number of uh, participants? Um, so the grant period is uh, the four-year timeline of, of the $3 million. So um, it'll be, uh, the selection will be made by ComEd in, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2017, uh, the trust recommendations. Um, and then the next round of funding will open up in 2021. So uh, ComEd's expectation is that if the, the selected program is, or programs are, um, are achieving their goals, uh, then so we aren't, we aren't sure what, it'll look, what uh, the process will look like in 2021. But it's reported. Yeah, another question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, are you looking for each grantee organization to uh, be of a certain size scope, like, like 100, 100 trainees a year, uh, 25 uh, trainees a year? Yeah. What, what's your goal or target? So the, uh, the statute outlines um, a sort of long-term goal for job placement of uh, 2,000 placements for those two priority groups that we talked about, um, but that's by 2029. Um, so if the organization can demonstrate that it's, it's playing a role in reaching that target you know, within the four-year time frame, um, that's kind of what we're looking for. How do you anticipate awarding? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. It depends on uh, on the number of proposals that we get. Uh, the and of course we want to make sure that we that we're covering the entire state of Illinois. So it depends. On, it really depends on the nature of the, of the scale of the partnership. Uh, uh, my question relates to uh, the maximum is uh, one million dollars. Is it any stretch to that, or this fixed one million period, one blank, that's over and done with? So, uh, in terms of the, uh, 
uh, how long the money will be available for. I'm going to ask folks to go on mute again on the line. We're hearing a lot of typing. I think that's uh, I'm referring to the first year. I'm leaving on three years. So I wouldn't, I don't know. If it's not completing $1 million for a whole three year period, I would not think that. The, the $1 million, so the, um, uh, the three million is the, the three million total is available for over for over four years. So whatever amount that is requested will be for that first four years. Yes. So if you request one, if you request one million, it will be for that first four year period. I'm going to just pull a question from uh, from the phone. Uh, there's a question about if there's a minimum and maximum age of recruits for the program. There is. There is not. Uh, please repeat who's eligible to be a lead applicant. So again, this is, uh, you can be private sector, nonprofit, government. Those are the criteria. We also have that posted and it's on the PowerPoint. Uh, the only, and uh, I'll just add to what Joanna just said, um, the only organizations that are not eligible to be lead applicants are um, organizations that are receiving funding from the other two um, workforce development programs, so the craft apprenticeship and the multicultural training. Um, if you, if you, if neither of those sound familiar, then you're probably <laughs> um, Can a wage be paid through the grant during the training? That's a good question. What was the question? I'm sorry. Can, can wages actually be paid through the grant? Like, can you put that into the budget um, during the four-year period? As an OJT, right? On the job training. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, we don't have any restrictions against that in the area. We're hearing conversations right now. Can you go on mute, please? It was hoped that when the design of the training programs, that they would be uh, in that proposal discussion about transportation, uh, day, uh, child care, uh, wages. Uh, these programs hopefully won't last more than four weeks, two to four weeks, maybe six, but that, that, all, that all will be considered so we don't to have people in a training program and not being able to take care of their family needs and so forth was irresponsible. And so the goal was trying to figure out how to do that. And that still is under, is, is under discussion. All right. So it will be possibly available for you. We're, we're hoping that companies that put, to put out themselves as being training would be considering that. And, and, um, and as you mentioned, the partnerships with employers are something that, that we're looking for. So that's uh, one way on the job training with, with wages could be done. Uh, Arthur Johnson with Emerson Park Development Corporation asked if this will be posted online. Yes, it will. Um, we are collecting all the questions from today. We'll have it available by early next week. Uh, it'll be on the trust website. There's a web page for the uh, solar pipeline RFP. Um, and it'll be available through Grant Central. Uh, so as you go, the, there'll be an information tab that you can look at the, the notes from this. But the PowerPoint will only be available online. We'll also send it uh, out to the registrants of today's information session. Yes. I'd like to ask a question about B on page four, Margie Gamble from SHICAST. It's uh, in the section on best practices for solar pipelines. In, in the first and second bullet point, you talk about <coughs> job training being incorporated in installation work and getting hands-on experience. C could you talk more about that? Is, is that something you're looking for the grantees to reach out to employers and organize? So um, the Illinois Solar for All program, which we mentioned, uh, that's it's, it's not doesn't fall under this workforce development section of the statute, but it, um, it's, it's a whole other part of the legislation. But it does require that uh, that all installations through that program, which is focused on low-income communities, uh, do incorporate job training. So that's the reason um, in the RFP we ask for how, how the applicant will interface with Illinois Solar for All. So um, is there a way to learn who is working under Illinois Solar for All as an installation contractor? Uh, to make those links? So Illinois Solar for All is, I, I believe the administrator hasn't been identified yet. So, okay. um, yes. And just to clarify that a little bit more, 
we don't know because we don't have a long-term plan yet. We don't know what the adjustable block incentive will be. So the companies have not made their plan yet, their business plans as to how they're going to enter the market. Um, they're standing at the ready to do so. And I think part of the um, employer partnership component could be to work with those employers to understand uh, what the requirements are for participating in Illinois Solar for All and hoping that happens. Okay. Sarah Jones, Paper Foundation. Um, so the target populations for this grant being um, returning citizens, foster youth alumni, and, citizens, and uh, community members from uh, these environmental justice communities. Um, for the grant allocation overall, are y'all looking to kind of apportion, are there specific percentages you're looking to apportion for people who are targeting specific subsections of those? Or is it just a big lump population and we want, we want to make sure that 100% of enrollees come from one of these three subsections? Uh, so it's, it's the latter, but also the, the training program doesn't have to be restricted to those groups, but it needs to include them. Um, there isn't a percentage of of, um, of recruits that need to be from those. That that's not uh, given in the RFP, but we just uh, the requirement is that you include those groups. The outcome goal is 50%, right? Well, the so 50% of all training. So there's kind of overlapping metrics here. There's uh, the priority groups, uh, returning citizens, and uh, uh, people from the foster system are the priority groups uh, for job placement in the, uh, in the statute. And, but 50% of all trainees should be recruited from environmental justice communities. Um, so they're kind of, they're not necessarily, they're overlapping metrics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Shonda Hayes YWCA, this goes in line, uh, alignment with the uh, minimum age requirement. Are we requiring a high school diploma GED for a candidate as well? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, you can so there's a question specifically in the in the uh, in the application about what assessment criteria your program will use um, for recruits, uh, but we are prescribed. There are questions here on the phone, and those on the phone can submit through the chat. So you should see that availability. This was the RFI that went out, and I think people put in a lot of work into responding to that. Is is there? I'm just wondering, is there any the relationship between that effort and this effort? So, Ahmed um, shared the uh, their. Um, the requests or the uh, kind of guidelines that were shared in the RFI with us, so we kind of used that to shape the RFP okay. and, and the evaluation criteria. But two two things, and I, Antonio just asked that question, is that the, but the goal was to encourage the groups that filled out the RFI to work cooperatively together to figure out ways in which we can take advantage of our FP. And that continually, I think you said it a couple of times, that the goal is to find partnerships. Everybody can't do everything, but some of us together can fulfill uh, some of the, the opportunities that are available from the RFP. And so that's the piece that we've got to still figure out. Uh, uh, the second piece is that uh, the sister from SAFER just asked, the question with the uh, solar for all and the issue, and you asked, the solar for all and these training programs, was the goal was even though they were dealt separately in the legislation, the goal is to figure out how to make sure that those things are linked together. And the timing is a challenge because some stuff is still rolling, as you said, but other stuff is about ready to roll. And so the goal is to figure out how we can make sure that they, when these training programs are engaged, that they can take advantage of the solar for all opportunities because the, the bottom line is for some of these trainees, the on-the-job experience from being on roofs, from doing the actual work is going to be very uh, uh, important in their being able to access jobs because folk, even you get through the training, the real issue is how much time are you putting on the roofs? 
uh, or, and it's not all solar roof, but how much time are you even in your training process actually doing some on the ground work? And there's some companies that are more, uh, have, have more of an appetite for helping folk get that on the job experience. There are other folks that want folks who have experience. And uh, so we, we work with that challenge that goes on. But as, as uh, Leslie said out very clearly, some of the companies are still trying to figure out where they're going to jump in and how they're going to do that. So the goal was to try to figure out how all those things came together. So, so I know you're asking questions about how this has worked out, but it's not worked out yeah. in some ways. But it is there. It has the potential of flowing very well if we can figure out get the right people in the room. Yeah, this is Antonio from Elbeco. I have a, just a follow-up on that because um, there was a lot of work that went into the RFIs in terms of pulling partners together and trying to vision out for four years. And just in terms of the timeline, I'm wondering if at the office hours, is it okay to kind of discuss that RFI work that went into it and, and versus, just, or is it just about, you know, maybe questions related to the R, this RFP? Uh, I, I, I'm open to discussing. Yeah, because it might just save us some time versus starting all over again. Okay. Just that somebody joined and we hearing a lot of background noise. Can you go on mute, please? Uh, I don't think it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it looks like someone on the. Um, Someone on the chat asked that can stipends be paid for training, say, $100 per week? Uh, the answer, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, similar to the question um, uh, whether whether wages can be paid uh, through the grant. Yes. Does that clarify? Is that stipends to the trainee? Is that what, is that, what that question is asking? Oh, yes. Um, or is that a stipend to the business hosting the trainee? Chi-Cat again. I, this may have been asked, but I, I, I don't remember the answer. If stipends or, or if can it be wages or must it be stipends or vice versa? And if it's wages, is there a minimum that must be adhered to? I, I think it's, it's either. So the um, I, the program can set um, can set a minimum for wages or stipends um, through so their employer law, partners. By law, there's no minimum wage that has to be adhered to. That was an issue in the kind of the weatherization program. <laughs> yeah, I mean we can clarify just to make sure, but we haven't seen any restriction now. Okay. All great questions. Are there any others? I have one. Mine is mine again. Mine is kind of little. Um, different from your normal questions, I believe. It relates to community reform in terms of our, I know we're focusing on job opportunities and creation uh, and development, but is there any kind of uh, focus or uh, priority given to those programs that are designed to have an impact on changing the community in which they're set up in? Am I, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, um, I think providing that kind of context will be helpful to us, um, right? I think when I talked about the policy committee, what we're looking at as uh, part of the policy review, uh, that kind of context of how this, this integrates with the community infrastructure. So I think that will be, I'm trying to think in the RFP where it's best to address that piece, but um, it's not the main criteria we'll be looking at, but that is the context that we're looking for is how do you, how do you target the priority populations? And that has a very important community context to it. And so that gets demonstrated by the partnerships that you have in place. Um, who, who knows how to reach those folks? Where are they coming from? 
So as we're looking at geographic scope as you're answering those questions, we not only want to know like the counties and places you're served, uh, sometimes there's confusion. Is, is it just the location we're housed in or is it the population or where they come from? We want to know both. So not, not geographically only where your organization may be housed. We want to know that, but we also need to know where you pull from and what, what communities you serve that way. Does that help answer your question? Oh, yes. Okay. I can add maybe a little bit onto that just from our familiarity. In, in terms of environmental justice communities, it's also around the communities that were specifically harmed for many, many years by the fossil fuel industries. Mm -hmm. And how we're, you know, so now really prioritizing solar and energy efficiency, it's not energy efficiency, but solar work. It's really at these particular geographic communities that the reforms that you're talking about are intended to, to impact because for so many years, our communities have been harmed detrimentally. Absolutely. Any other questions, uh, either on the phone or people in the room? Great. So we will be around. Uh, we're set to end at 4? At 4 o'clock. Yeah. So we'll be here till 4. And I'm hoping you all take the opportunity not only just to talk to us, but to talk to each other. I want to thank everybody on the on the call who dialed in. Again, um, we will have all this information available next week. We'll get out to you via email, but also it'll be available on the trust website. We also hope that you get that out to your partners. We're trying to distribute this as much as possible. And, and again, really being sensitive to geographic spread and making sure that we're reaching uh, organizations outside of the, the seven county Chicago region, which is largely the trust audience. We've marketed this to DCEO. I'm trying to think of the other avenues we use to try to get to partners outside of this region. Um, we've marketed to community foundations across the state. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So we need all of your help in promotion as well. We know this is a tight turnaround. And, um, and for those on the phone, um, we'll also share the uh, contact, unless anyone has objections, we'll share contact information for um, for people who are here today with, with uh, people who are attending virtually so that um, if you want to connect the network with others, uh, you can do that. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you.